Hello, everyone. Steve Edelman here. I'm going to be your host today for our podcast and my good friend and colleague and co-host most of the time, Dr. Jeremy Pettis, is off on vacation. That son of a... Well, he deserves it. He works as, he works pretty hard. Now, today, uh, we have a very special guest, long-term friend of mine, Dr. Daniel Einhorn, and I'll introduce him a little bit more, but I want to introduce the topic first. And you may not have heard of this issue, and we want to educate you today. It is called hypercortisolism. Cortisol is a steroid. Hyper means too much. And it's a very particular uh, problem that we see in people with type 2 diabetes and people without diabetes. So, Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. It's great to be here. Well, give the listeners, I almost said viewers, <laughs> I do that all the time, <laughs> a brief background on you, Dan Einhorn. So I've been friends with Steve now for a little over 30 years. Um, watch Steve's meteoric rise in the me- uh, media world as well as the uh, medical world. And I've just always appreciated his uh, honesty and his down-home uh, clarity. Um, so if you want to know what's true and you want to hear clearly, um, listen to Steve. Well, thanks, Dan, for telling us about yourself. But, uh, <laughs> I'll do that. So in the meantime, yeah. I was also a, a clinical endocrinologist. I spent time uh, loving to take care of patients uh, most days. Also involved in the research. Also involved in teaching. And also involved in um, some uh, medical leadership. The American College of Endocrinology. I was its president. Um, and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. I was its president. And uh, really uh, enjoyed very much that kind of work. And about three years ago, I uh, was really asked to consult about this issue of uh, you know, excess cortisol. And when I was called, I said, you know, you got the wrong number. You know, I'm, I'm a diabetes guy. You know, uh, I don't even know who to send you to because we don't think about cortisol. And that was a fact we just, you know, never have in uh, diabetes. But as I read and as I consulted more, I realized, holy cow, this is something that's right under my nose. I've looked at it for years, and I didn't recognize what it was. And I realized, how many patients have I missed this in who I could have helped, you know, had I only known? So... I, Here I, I am, having switched switch gears, moved into industry, so I could do the study that we're talking about now, and I hope to spend the rest of my days doing studies like this. You know what? Uh, as an endocrinologist myself, I felt the same way. Okay, well let's let's get into it and describe it. What the heck is hypercortisolism? Well, it's just what you said, Steve. It's too much cortisol. Why does the body do this? That's another story. You know, we don't really know, but it does it for every hormone you know, right? For thyroid, for parathyroid, there's a condition where the body makes too much of it. Um, with cortisol, it's maybe especially interesting because it's a stress hormone. So you think, well, uh, if I'm just very stressed, that'll do it. But uh, we're talking about something a little different. So, for example, if a person is uh, depressed, and I test them for this hypercortisolism, they won't have it. They will you know, respond normally. Um, if th- their diabetes is out of control, you say, well, that's a stressful thing all by itself. But what we found is not everybody with diabetes is so stressed that they have hypercortisolism. It's only a certain number of people where their bodies are something about their physiology. Just like there's something about people of insulin resistance, this is very much in that same camp. You know, why do some people have insulin resistance? Well, for some of them, it's actually about cortisol, and for some of the other, you know, genetic reasons. You know, the, the amount of cortisol someone may secrete, I know it's a continuum. So talk briefly about one end of the spectrum, Cushing's disease. Yeah. And that's a condition where it's so obvious, uh, it, picking it up by a doctor is not that difficult. And then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is normal. And then hypercortisolism seems to be uh, right in the middle. Yeah, I think that's a very good way to say it. So when people said Cushing's to me, uh, it meant just who you were saying, that the, you know, one in a million, you know, 12 in a million, very, very rare, uh, extremely sick. Uh, their, their, their faces are distorted, their skin is distorted, um, and they're just very, very sick from truly high amounts of cortisol. Usually that's a pituitary tumor, a benign tumor, the pituitary in the brain. And that just makes so much ACTH, which leads to high, so much cortisol. And that's a very sick population. But that's just the extreme 
of excess cortisol. I mean, there's an extreme in every hormone disease, but we don't know. We know, for example, in, with aldosterone or other hormones, it's much more common to have milder versions of excess. But even the milder versions really harm people. The milder versions give them excess cardiovascular disease, makes their diabetes and their hypertension much harder to control, makes them feel ill. So there's nothing mild about milder hypercortisolism. It's excess cortisol. And any degree of excess cortisol will make you sick. Well, I think the other issue is, as I'm learning over the last couple months, is that you know it, it grows on you slowly. It's not like one day you're normal, the next day you got hypercortisolism. And the symptoms that you're describing can be missed by the person living with hypercortisolism and the healthcare professional. So if you had to describe a patient with hypercortisolism, and I know you've mentioned some of the symptoms already, can you do it again and we could listen and try to picture what that person looks like from their weight to other medical problems that go along with it? Well, my answer may be surprising to you. You, you generally cannot look at someone and know whether they have excess cortisol or not. And that's very important um, because you, you only know in the extremes you can pick it up. But they may not be heavier than the next person. Their, their skin won't be different. You know, a lot of people have trouble sleeping. A lot of people have some anxiety and depression. A lot of people have type 2 diabetes that uh, has hypertension as part of it. So it, it's not necessarily um, obvious. You have to be thinking about it in anybody who has difficulty with their diabetes. So it's not what the person looks like. It's what's happening to the person. They're, you're giving them all the right diabetes medicines, and they're just not working. You know, in, in the Catalyst study, the average A1C was 8.8. .8. And that's despite three or more meds and insulin and other meds and lots of hypertension meds. 8.8, so .8, you know, no, no one will argue that's poor control. Well, yeah. let, me, let me have you describe that study a little bit more in detail and a little slower. <laughs> we're, yeah. Our listeners, we're not rocket scientists. <laughs> but that Catalyst study, um, I mean, in, in a short, showed that hypercortisolism is much more common than we previously thought. But describe the inclusion criteria, because that may help answer my question I asked you a few minutes ago. What does that person look like? Not really look, but is described like. Yeah, so for the Catalyst study, we looked for people who are having trouble controlling their diabetes. That was defined as having an A1C, um, average in the end 8.8, .8, but actually 7.5 and up. Despite taking three meds, you know, whatever meds they were, or insulin and other meds, or uh, taking uh, multiple meds and having complications of diabetes, or taking multiple meds and having tough to control high blood pressure. Those are the four main ways that you got into the study. And then hypercortisolism was uh, defined as having a dexamethasone test where you take a pill of dexamethasone at 11 o'clock at night and get a blood test the next morning at 8 o'clock above a certain level. That, was, that showed you had excess cortisol. Yeah, and that's, and that's the population that we studied. Well, just before you go through the results uh, to explain to the listeners, um, dexamethasone, if you take that one pill at night, it should suppress your own body's production of cortisol. And if it doesn't do that, then that gives us a clue that you may have hypercortisolism. And that was one of the questions we're going to cover later on, but we can do it now. That's one of the important screening tests uh, is you take one milligram of this type of steroid called dexamethasone, and then in the morning you get your cortisol level. So in this particular study, uh, you went to a large clinic, I take it, and you just looked at people that had these criteria that were tough to control despite multiple medications, and you just looked at the numbers of people who had abnormal cortisols in the morning. Is, is that right? Well, first we looked at uh, everyone who was uh, that population with difficult to control diabetes. Because in the end, we want to see uh, are the people with excess cortisol different? Apropos your original question, in what ways are they different? Um, I already told you they don't look different. But we, we looked at everybody, you know, where do they come from, how old are they, how, how heavy are they, um, and, and again, what you know, meds are they taking, what ethnicity are they, what race are they, uh, in the end to see how many had hypercortisol, and then what were they like, and were those with excess cortisol different in some way. So I would, 
if I could answer your question in a, in, in, in a way that, wow, we found something that I could just look at somebody and they're different, that would be fantastic. But that's not the way it goes. Yeah, so to describe the uh, characteristics of the individuals that tested positive for hypercortisolism. We already know that they were on the multiple medications, their blood pressure, their diabetes, other medical problems were not under good control, and their A1C was 8.8. What about other characteristics? How about blood pressure? Uh, Were they overweight? Things like that. So again, it's it's a it's a mixed bag, and 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 it's interesting. So blood pressure is a, is is a good example. If people were taking three or more blood pressure meds, then they had a thirty five percent chance of having hypercortisolism. So that really pulled people out. Um, if people already had uh, some form of heart disease, uh, heart failure, uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, had a heart attack, coronary artery disease, um, they were much more likely to have uh, hypercortisolism. But in general, people with hypercortisolism needed more of everything. They needed more of uh, all diabetes drugs, more blood pressure drugs, more uh, drugs for cholesterol, more psychiatric drugs. Almost 30% were taking psychiatric drugs, more analgesics. So it's a population that's, you know, hurting um, you know, in, in, in many ways. Uh, but, you know, there was no cutoff. You know, this number of meds plus that number of meds, you're automatically uh, having hypercortisol. It's just that the population as a group had more disease and were failing more meds. Yeah, and, and for our listeners, once again, to do a clinical study, you got to really set criteria so the study results mean something. And I, I get what you're saying. It's <laughs> one size doesn't fit all. Now, talk about the mood. Where does mood come in, um, this whole issue? I can see the weight, the blood pressure, the cholesterol, but you keep talking about mood, and uh, obviously cortisol must have some effect on mood. Yeah, well, the brain is probably the most sensitive organ to cortisol. And, you know, we're all familiar with people with diabetes often just not feeling well. It's not exactly depression. It's not exactly anxiety. uh, It's not exactly sleep apnea, but it's some combination of all those so with um, uh, abnormal cortisol, the first thing that happens is you lose the normal rhythm of cortisol, which should dip overnight. And one of the consequences is you, you just don't sleep well. It may have trouble falling asleep. If you wake up, you may have trouble getting back to sleep. And so you're relatively um, sleepless, which you know, causes you know, fatigue and all the things that go with sleeplessness. But it also affects the way you think. Think of cortisol as a stress hormone. So, you know, when you see a bear coming at you, your uh, brain really focuses on what needs to be done. Um, It really alerts you, um, and your heart races, you you get uh, ready to to run. Imagine if that's going on all the time, even when there isn't a bear coming at you, and imagine how that feels to have the, uh, the, that stress hormone coursing through you. So people, the first thing they describe when they're treated for this is they sleep better. And the second thing is that they, they, they think more clearly and just feel less anxious. By the way, imagine if I gave you um, a, a, a dose of prednisone and you know, uh, created that state of excess cortisol. You know, one of the first things is you'd be hungry. And you'd be hungry for calorically rich foods, right? You wouldn't sleep well. You'd be kind of anxious. You'd be kind of uh, irritable and impatient. Um, a lot of things that happen if anybody has excess cortisol. Yeah, it might be, in medical school, we learned about steroid psychosis. So people get steroids for one of a variety of medical conditions, and they basically go crazy uh, in layman's sense. Yeah. So steroids can save you, but they can also mess you up. And I'm getting the sense that with this hypercortisolism, it goes on for years before someone may discover it and Unfortunately, some people go through their whole life not discovered. Uh, and I have a, this, this is an important question. Um, when you describe these patients, I'm thinking that I have a lot of patients that fit this. In fact, more patients that fit this than don't with type 2 diabetes. How do you differentiate, and there's probably no good easy answer between those that are just people with type 2 diabetes that have difficult time controlling their medical conditions or 
those that have actual hypercortisolism. Uh, you know, we don't want everybody that's listening to run to their doctor and say, I need to be screened for hypercortisolism, but maybe they should. So as, as you say, that, you know, there's no uh, single criterion. It's basic when things are not working out and it doesn't make sense. You know, you've given the right medicines, you've given them their GLP-1, their SGLT-2 and insulin and metformin and, it, 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 and, and you're confident that the person is you're taking the meds. You, the person, know you're taking the meds. I mean, it's not that you don't want to take them. You take them, uh, and it's just not working. That's when you su- should suspect that there's something else going on. By the way, we do exactly this with, with blood pressure. You give people you know, three or four blood pressure meds, and it's just not working. Blood pressure is not getting under control. That's when you start to think, well, maybe there's another problem going on here. And for about a quarter of people with high blood pressure, that's too much of another hormone called aldosterone, made in the same gland as cortisol. So we have a model for this. This is not weird. This is a you know, common enough thing in clinical medicine. Yeah, now... Um we know that cortisol comes from the adrenal gland. Are there, what are the different causes of hypercortisolism? Uh, I know that this, it's just not all overproduction by the adrenal gland. There might be little tumors. There might be too much secretion from the pituitary gland. Maybe you could, in lay terms, <laughs> <laughs> describe that. Yeah. So in general, when people uh, present with diabetes uh, and hypertension, the cause is the adrenal gland making too much cortisol. And we now know that in some of them, there's something obvious you can see in the adrenal gland that's making it. In some cases, you don't see anything that's uh, abnormal. You're, you're talking about like an MRI or a CT? Yeah, CT. Okay. Usually. Yeah, an, a non-contrast CT, which is a simple enough test with very low um, radiation. Um, but uh, the, the, the people who present in the classic severe form, they're the ones who generally have a a pituitary tumor, uh, which has a very specific surgical treatment for it. And they're, as I said, really, really sick. You'll, you'll, you'll see them. And then there's another, uh, source where it's neither the adrenals nor the pituitary, but an excess group of cells somewhere else called ectopic. And again, why that happens, you know, no one knows. But these ectopic tumors also can produce very high amounts of the hormone that stimulates AC, uh, stimulates cortisol, and people get very sick with that. So for the folks we're talking about, the, the hypercortisolism, um, we're, what's the most common source for those folks? If there is, you know, it's not the pituitary, yep. and it's probably not ectopic, am I guessing it's mostly just over-secretion by the adrenal gland? Exactly, yeah, which we have, again, the model with the aldosterone again. I mean, we know that the adrenal glands do this. Why they do this, uh, we don't know. By the way, there's a third class of hormones made in the uh, adrenal cortex. That's androgens. And we know for some women, their adrenal glands make excess androgens as a whole category of hyperandrogenic disease. So the adrenal glands do this, um, and we really don't know why they choose to do it. Yeah, and for for you uh, non-anatomical folks out there, the adrenal glands are very close to the kidneys. You have two of them on each side. And the pituitary gland is in the center of your brain, uh, secretes a hormone that goes down into the bloodstream and stimulates the adrenal glands to secrete cortisol. So this is bread and butter endocrinology for folks like Dan and myself. Because in our field, you have uh, too much secretion of certain things and too little. So type 1 diabetes is too little. And in type 2 diabetes, you might get too much secretion of insulin in the early stages, but we don't want to get off topic too much. Um, Well, let's talk about the best way to screen. We already talked about the overnight dexamethasone suppression test, which seems like the easiest way to go. I've prescribed it a few times for my patients recently. Are there other screening tests where you can look for cortisol, saliva, uh, other, other types of areas? So the good and bad news is that the other tests are generally not worth doing in the form of a hypercortisolism that produces the diabetes. That's difficult to control. Um, you mentioned the saliva test, and that uh, can be an excellent test. The problem is there are just hundreds of ways to mess it up. 
you know, stuff you have on your fingers, stuff you have on your face, stuff you have that you know, that you've eaten or ingested. Um, and so it's it, it's a it's a very variable test. It's not very sensitive. Um, another test that's again no fun to do is a twenty four hour urine collection for what's called free cortisol. Again, it's just not a very sensitive test. So a normal test doesn't doesn't help you. And so it's really high index of suspicion. And as you said, the dexamethasone suppression test. Yeah. Can, can I say, though, doing that test, you know, you have to be where a lot of things can give you a false positive. And they're you know, not, not rare things. So if a woman is taking oral estrogens, the test will be falsely positive. If a person is actively alcoholic, um, not sleeping, um, end-stage kidney disease, there's, there's a list of things you need to know. Uh, that could give you a false uh, a positive. But if you exclude those things, it's your most sensitive and most reliable test. Yeah, that, well, that's good to know. I mean, we're not going to memorize that list. No. Uh, but it's good to know that uh, anybody who orders it would know that list. And I would think the most common person to order this test, if you brought it up with them, would be an endocrinologist. Um, I'm Not that I'm putting down primary care doctors, but I doubt if too many would know about hypercortisolism. I could be wrong on that. Well, you know, in the uh, world of uh, treating these patients, there's a lot of primary care physicians who've taken it upon themselves to uh, be essentially diabetologists, and they've been thinking about this problem for um, for a long time. The test, as you describe, is pretty easy to do for the patient, and if it's normal, it's normal. You know, you can you know you can move on. Uh, if it's abnormal, there's some thinking you have to do, and maybe uh, if you screen for it, it's abnormal, you may want to then speak with an endocrinologist. But certainly doing the first step, um, anyone should be able to do. All right. Dan stands up for the primary care doctor. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know what? Um, I have utmost respect for them, and I think I do know uh, more and more of primary care doctors are getting um, specialty trained in diabetes. So they're not endocrinologists. But they certainly know as much as most endocrinologists do about diabetes, which is the most common condition in endocrinology. Well, let's talk about, uh, in general terms, uh, the kinds of therapy that's out there if you're diagnosed with hypercortisolism. You know, not the extreme cases and the big, you know, pituitary tumor, but the kind of hypercortisolism that we're discussing today that is way more common than previously thought. So I want to say that the the treatment part of the study, so to really to see how this kind of a population responds to treatment, is just on, ongoing now. And we won't know the results uh, really until kind of next year's ADA. And so we're in this temporary, I won't say a limbo, but uh, it's, it, it, it's uncertain, it's not, not proven that this population will do well with treatment. We know from history that people like this, like the ones in the study, have done well. And there's a variety of uh, medication therapies. And there are surgical therapies for those in whom you see a, a surgical cause on um, imaging. I uh, see. And the, um, the important point that we know from certainly the surgical cases is that if cortisol is the problem, then you have to treat the cortisol, not just the things that cortisol does. So let's say you, you find a uh, benign tumor on one adrenal gland, and you can take it out. Well, then that person benefits from having uh, fewer uh, need for meds, fewer bad events, and, and they live longer. This has been shown in surgical studies. If you only treat the sugar, the uh, blood pressure, the cholesterol, the mood, and you don't treat the cortisol, People can't do as well. They still have many uh, more events than, uh, than others. They uh, die sooner. The mortality is increased. Um, don't scare our don't listeners, please. Well. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, so it is important to address the cortisol yeah, part of things. I get it. You, you know, if you don't address the root problem, you're just putting a Band-Aid on right. things. It's like if the thyroid is too high, well, I can slow your heart rate down, but you'll still be sick from the excess thyroid. Yeah, so... All right, Dan. Well, um, I'm going to give you the final word to summarize what we talked about, and then um, we can end the podcast, and we'll probably do an article in our newsletter on this topic as well, because I think the word needs to get out, not only to people like myself who see patients and probably missed many, 
uh, and also to the people living with the condition. And I think that's where, you know, the whole name of the organization comes from, taking control of your diabetes. And if any of the information that Dr. Einhorn and I said about hypercortisolism, if it rings a bell in your mind of yourself or someone you love, then for sure you need to bring this topic up with his or her doctor. So Dan, uh, let you summarize and say the last words. Thanks, Steve. So basically, it's a message to people who, um, you know, if you find that your diabetes is just not responding to therapy, you know, you're doing all the right things, your clinician is doing all the right things, and you're just not getting there. Uh, you know, historically, people just, you know, threw up their hands. That's life. But the fact is that uh, we've learned now that uh, one in four people uh, whose diabetes is just not coming under control have a treatable cause. And that treatable cause is excess cortisol for whatever reason. Um, and it has a, an effect on really everything about your day-to-day, how you sleep, how, how you feel, how you think, um, you know, how you try to lose weight, you do, and how many medicines you need to control your diabetes or blood pressure or psychological things, et cetera. Um, it can be diagnosed and the treatments are developing rapidly. In some people, the treatment is a uh, outpatient, uh, relatively um, minimally invasive surgery that literally takes away the source of the cortisol. Um, for others, it's going to be um, some form of medication. There's a few medications already out in the world, um, and uh, we're, we're studying one of them, and we'll know by ADA next year uh, just how efficacious uh, this medicine is in people with diabetes. And so we're very excited uh, we, to have found something that really has been under our noses forever, and we just didn't look. And once you look for it, you find it. I think just knowing that you have it is a reward enough, is satisfying enough. It's not your fault. There's this other thing going on. Uh, and then as treatments get better, it'll be more and more rewarding. Well, I think... That was an excellent summary and um, really appreciate your time, taking the time to come out and speak to us at the podcast. And I'm looking forward to some of the feedback we get from our listeners on that. So, And then for, the, for you other listeners, uh, we're going to do a dose of Dr. E without the P and Dr. E2 in, in a few minutes. And we're going to have that uh, sent out in probably a few weeks. So thank you, Dan. Okay. Thank you, Steve. This podcast was supported through a sponsorship from Corsep Therapeutics.